right, let's get started. So hey everybody, my name is Okar Litter. I am a product manager at Tenable. At Tenable, we provide a cybersecurity platform that you can use to analyze your exposure and risk for all of your assets in one place. That includes, for example, um, risk-based or priority and risk-based vulnerability management on your workloads, um, configuration management or misconfigurations on your cloud resources, including Kubernetes and cloud native resources. Then, uh, I said that twice. Um, web application security, identity security, and a lot of other things. So all of that coming together in one place, because that's how you need to look at security, not in silos in, in you know, one vulnerability in, at one resource level. I primarily focus on shift left and container security. Um, so that's the area I play in, and that's why I'm here, to talk to you today about embedding um, policy as code in your GitOps and CICD um, builds and lifecycle. I have this slide here on how amazing and awesome Cloud Native is and Kubernetes is, but I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here since you're all here. But I remember a story I went to KubeCon North America, first time ever, and I was really convinced that everybody who speaks there or goes there as an attendee basically can code an operator in their sleep and they dream about CRDs. And when I got there, I was pleasantly surprised that I was wrong People go there who are, are newcomers, beginners, go there to learn things, and so that's why I left this in here, right? Because I know we're being live streamed and also this will go on uh, replay later. So for folks who are new to all this, um, the point I, I want to make here is cloud native infrastructure is fueling innovation. There are two main reasons for that. One is increased velocity and less process friction. These numbers you know, tell the same story. This is coming from CNCF survey 2020. There's another one in 2021, and these numbers go up slightly, right? So 92% of organizations using containers in production. I remember maybe like 10 years ago, I'm from the Bay Area, I was living, uh, I was uh, visiting um, or meeting up with a friend in a cafe, and he was so excited about containers, and it was a brand new thing back then. I feel like now it's more of a commodity, everybody sort of uses it in their day-to-day -day development uh, lives, right? So 92% using in production, 82% organizations using Kubernetes, Kubernetes is obviously a big leader, or has a big lead in the orchestration race. Um, and then 30% using organizations using quote unquote newer technologies like serverless in production as well. So cloud native, apart from, I don't know if you've seen the cloud native, cloud native landscape, but like you literally need a magnifying glass in order to see the little uh, cards on that page. But apart from all of the tools and frameworks, cloud native brings a change in culture as well as processes and mindset, right? That's more important to me because technology comes second, people come first. Um, it provides extremely high pace infrastructure, right? We all know this. You can set up and tear up clusters in a matter of minutes in all of the major cloud providers. Um, that is not to say that the underneath architecture and technology is not complex, but they are able to hide that from the developers using simple to use interfaces. Right? And lastly, I see a lot of companies building stuff on top of Kubernetes. So Kubernetes by itself is not something that developers necessarily can consume uh, outrightly. So I've worked with serverless environments, for example, where it almost feels like I'm back in the Heroku Cloud Foundry world, where I have my local code and I use, do a CF push, and it pushes my code. Under the scenes, it might be using Istio for service mesh. I think the one I used used Plaquito for a source to image build, et cetera. But all of that, again, is hidden from the developer, giving them an easier way to manage runtimes uh, and um, deploy at scale on the cloud. Right? Sounds great. Just like the wallpaper. Who remembers this? Anybody? Yeah? This is all, yeah? However, is this velocity leaving you vulnerable? Right? This is the crux of the talk. So it's nice, it's nice and awesome to move fast, but what are you missing out on? Specifically from the Kubernetes uh, point of view and, uh, and coming in from a developer lens because I was the developer for a while before I got into product management. Um, again, if you read the blogs and stuff, there's tons of ways to slice and dice this information and put it into different categories. This is what I think, again, from a developer lens, uh, where the security problems come in. And there's always a flip side to this, right? So developer-focused management, what I mean by that is um, Developers, again, are able to spin up clusters. Developers, DevOps, SREs, and other technical teams, in my experience, are in charge or manage the clusters, right? 
security in most organizations that I talk to and most customers I speak with, security still lies in with the security teams, and there's a big gap there. Right? So with that um, disconnect, the best case scenario is you slow down your velocity because secur security teams will not let you, will not allow you to push stuff to production that has a vulnerability. Worst case scenario is you, you expand your exposure service and attack surface because you're letting things go into production. Right, so that's number one. Easy for developers, however, security takes a, takes a backseat and is managed, in my experience, by somebody else. Second is uh, default configurations are not secure. Right, before, now, before you get up and start throwing tomatoes at me, Kubernetes has a very good security system built in. My point here, here is it's not turned on by default in most cases, and that's, and that's the problem. Right? And there's a reason for that. Um, default configuration drives a certain kind of behavior. Right? Kubernetes is built for speed, performance, scalability, and that's why it has the defaults it has. And like I said, every level in that architecture in Kubernetes has the levers and control built in for security. But in a lot of cases I see, um, developers go with what given by default, and that generally is not good enough. And the last one, again, from a developer point of view, is privilege, manage privilege management. So this is, again, if you think about, you have your infrastructure layer, then you have your, um, and then you have your platform as a service, and then you have your application, and now you're building microservices on top of that. Um, deploying, for example, EKS on AWS. AWS has its own um, policies, user groups, et cetera. And then Kubernetes comes in with its own RBAC system for authorization. Um, and so you have to be very careful, and that introduces complexity, that any change you make at the lower layer need to then propagate to the other layer as well, because they both are tied to each other. Right, so these three, in my viewpoint, is what makes Kubernetes difficult, or security difficult in Kubernetes. And also, if you talk to, I've talked to many customers, if you read these white papers and things like that, right? Um, down in the weeds, like what are the top concerns that security people have? So one is, am I able to define consist consistent policies across my teams? Right. Second is, once I've defined that, am I then able to apply these policies across my many clusters as well as many cloud providers? Right. Every customer I talk to, usually there's a public cloud provider, um, plus there is something on-prem that's going on. Right. And you want to be able to apply the same policy consistently across. And the third thing is, how do I get my developers to honor the same policies on the very left on their uh, laptops? Because uh, that's where everything starts. So this is my uh, sort of recommendation if you're new to security in Kubernetes. I would say look at these things first. So on the very left is Kubernetes misconfigurations. So you want to be able to create a single policy framework for governance and access control. So this is when we talk, this is how we talk about policy as code, right? You want to be able to say, hey, here are my set of policies and associated benchmarks, and I need to apply this, again, consistently, consistently throughout that life cycle, the development life cycle. Um, examples could include, for um, you might have a policy that says that you're, you're not allowed to run any root container in your cluster. That's an example. Or you might have a policy that says your Kubernetes API server cannot be publicly accessible. Right? And these are all what we call configurations, and a violation of such a policy would be considered a misconfiguration. Moving a little bit to the right, then you want to again apply the same policies in your CI CD lifecycle. Right? And that's when Let's say you have infrastructure as code. Uh, whenever a new commit comes in, a new PR is open, you again want to test against the same policies and disallow that PR if a policy is violated. But that's the misconfiguration side of things, right? Then you want to be able to check for vulnerabilities and images as well. Um, I've worked with an open source project called, it was called Pira. Um, they were based out of Spain, Barcelona. It's a great team to work with. And I remember us running, you know, whatever comes default with Docker, that um, the vulnerability uh, scanner. And then as long as everything looked medium-ish, it was fine, right? So that's the developer take on it. And that's why policies are important, to enforce, uh, to avoid that kind of behavior, enforce uh, strict policies. So again, very important to scan your images uh, before they get into your uh, runtime, obviously, because you know, one CVE and one vulnerability is propagated multiple times in your production on your runtime environment. And finally, once you have all of these three pieces in place, 
then it's really important to look at sort of the whole picture together. You want to look at your uh, how you apply your ex ex exclusions. Can't say that word. Um, how you remediate, uh, putting in autom automated processes to be able to do that. Right, that's sort of the last step. Okay, I think I'm going really fast, which is good. I usually am slow. Um, okay, so just strictly looking at your CI/CD pipelines and security guard guardrails in that in that context, uh, policy as code is again a perfect way to do it. Um, policy as code. So if you know infrastructure as code, the benefits that that brought to the infrastructure layer in terms of uh, repeatability, uh, reducing human errors. The same thing is, uh, is brought by policy as code through your rego policy files into your, um, into your policies, right? The, the, the main power of policy as code, I've listed three here, so the first is low friction, right? Because it's policy as code, it can work with existing development environments, tools, and frameworks, right? So if you're using your uh, um, Jenkins or Travis or GitHub Actions or whatever you're using in your pipeline, you can very easily embed um, a tool that'll check for violations in there. The second one is more secure by default. Since you are writing these policies and even before you actually initialize your infrastructure, you bring that up, you're by default more secure because you're checking for all of that even before your infrastructure comes up. And then finally, increased security visibility. Because it's policy as code, you check the policy files back into your um, um, SEM. Um, and so uh, that way, you have visibility, visibility around what the different teams are doing, and you can monitor it there. Right, so very important. So if there's one thing that I keep repeating here uh, that you should go away with is policy check. It doesn't just apply at one place. You need to apply the same policies consistently across that lifecycle, all the way from very left on your developer machine to your CI pipelines to your CD pipelines and then apply the same plus additional policies on your runtime containers, right? So once they, are, they have left sort of your world and gone into your uh, production environment. Okay, so this is where, this is where TerraScan comes in. It's an open source uh, solution by Tenable. You can see it's available on GitHub. A um, lot of, uh, driven by community, a lot of interest, as you can see here, by your forks and stars. And I know that's not the only way to measure that, but you know, it's one way. Uh, it comes with 500 plus policies out of the box. It supports IAC engines like Kubernetes, um, or sorry, IAC engines like Terraform, Helm charts, customized Docker files, so you can scan all of those. Plus, uh, it also has benchmark support, um, specifically CIS. It leverages the open policy agent engine if you want to create your own custom policies or um, expand on the existing built-in policies. And I'll show you this in action and also uh, tell you a way you can go look at it. Or We have built a tool where you can test it without actually downloading it and doing it on your terminal. All right, so GitOps, like how many folks here actually practice GitOps uh, frameworks and, okay, very cool. All right, so this is a more of a uh, simplified version of what a GitOps workflow might look like. So you have your engineer on the left pushing some code to your SEM, maybe that's GitHub. Um, once that code gets pushed, um, a good practice might be to run a GitHub action or a GitLab runner, whatever, to then build an image. You want to run all of your unit tests, and then if everything goes well, you get all green, so you want to then push that image into an image repository, public, private, right? Um, then, at the same time, you trigger an agent like Argo CD, which is looking at your repository, to start your GitOps process. Right, so you've got a quote unquote good image sitting in your image repository. Argo CD says, oh, there's, there's a new image I need to deploy. It then tells, uh, it's got that information and it tells your runtime. So in this case, maybe it's Kubernetes. Uh, hey, go get that image, do your thing. And this might be a simple, you know, kubectl set image kind of uh, command. Kubernetes then goes, pulls that image and it uh, rolls it out. You know, it takes care of all of that for you. So what I'm suggesting and recommending here with uh, adding your security policies at different levels in this life cycle 
is first you put in your TerraScan checks and policy checks right on the developer's machine, right? One way to do that is using pre-commit hooks uh, or Git hooks. And so this is an example from the TerraScan site. Um, I have to say some, so I have not tried this, this exact code, but it, again, it should uh, get my point across that you have a uh, Terraform pre-commit hook which runs before every time a developer does a git commit and it runs the it runs a certain set of policies that you have created or using the pre-build pre policies against the, in this case, it's the ISC files. And you can see down here, it says your uh, container is missing a live, liveliness probe and also some of the resources in terms of memory uh, is not set, right? So that's number one, right on the left, right on the left. Uh, the second one is on the CI side. So in your continuous integration, after you've done your linting, you've done your unit tests and whatnot, then you put in uh, checks and balances there. And this could, again, would differ based on what your, what your uh, code looks like. For IAC, it would be a different set of policies. For vulnerabilities, it would be a different set. Uh, a way to do that, I've shown here, is with uh, GitHub uh, Actions. So there's a TerraScan job. Uh, yes. OK, uh, wait. Yeah, this is correct. So there's a TerraScan job action, which uh, takes in certain parameters, so your repository, what kind of IAC you're uh, checking against, uh, and it'll check out the code and run that, and only pass the build if, uh, and you can set that in the configuration too, because that might depend on your team, right? So you may want to be, you may be okay with a certain number of threshold in terms of low, medium, high, uh, and critical vulnerabilities. Okay. The third thing uh, is to introduce the same set of policies or extend those policies in your CD pipeline. So this is where Argo CD comes in and syncs with your GitHub repository. You put in what is called a uh, Argo CD webhook, but it's a pre-sync type of webhook. So every time before a sync happens, it'll check out the code. Of course, you pass it the right uh, secrets in terms of uh, your repo access, private repo access. And then you can see at the end here, there's a command that runs the Terrascan, uh, that runs the Terrascan uh, binary um, on your, in this case, the type of uh, infrastructure we are setting is Kubernetes. So it might be Terraform files that it's running against, uh, or sorry, um, it might be Helm charts or customized files. So that's number three. And I have a, this is the demo that I was hoping would work. If not, I do have a video here. Let's see. I'm gonna uh, try it one more time. So, let me see. Make you tunnel. And this is where I was having problems earlier. That is, nope. All right, let me go, I'm gonna cheat a little and go and try and grab the secret that has my uh, password. Let's see if that works. Okay, so I'm in my Argo CD app now. And let's create, I've got two applications here. I can actually show this to you. Even if the demo doesn't work, um, this will be good to see. So I've got my, this is, by the way, this is public, uh, forked it from my colleague. You can go to his or come in here. Um, and this sets up Argo CD in Minikube. It sets up the TerraScan job, connects it to the admission controller. So every time, and it creates that sync, the pre-sync webhook with Argo CD. So every time you come in and it starts to sync, it'll create a new job with TerraScan and do the, do the scan. That's what's going on here. The deployment file is what I was looking at before. So this does all of that. Um, and the demo would show you two different apps. So there's a test app good. 
And to be really frank with you, this app is actually not, no, I want to show you the bad app first. So if I go to test app bad and open the, the deployment file, I was going to say, to be really frank with you, this does not look that bad to me, right? So this is probably what I would do when I was starting with Kubernetes. I've got my liveliness probe, my readiness probe. Those are two things that people always add. Um, what else? I've got some labels, which is always nice, and I've got my, I'm not hard coding anything, I've got my environment variable set up, right? So this is a pretty decent looking app, uh, but if I, let's see, if I can get this to work, if not, again, we'll go back to the video. So I'm gonna say, hey, create a new application. Um, let me see if I have the namespace created. So it should be an app, nope. Okay, so let me go to repo, and then I'm going to kubectl apply Apple. All right, so now kubectl get namespace. So I've got this app namespace created here. Okay, so in this one, test good app. I'm gonna pick this as my project. Uh, manual think is okay. I'm gonna leave the rest as defaults. Then if I go into my repository, let me grab that URL. It's happy with that. And then it needs a path for my bad app, which I'll get from here. All right, so I've got my app done here. Let me create this. Oh, I'm missing this. So yeah, I want to deploy my existing cluster with the namespace of app. And again, like in real world, you'll probably do this through YAML files and not using the UI, but let's just demo. Uh, let's see, so I've got, let me zoom in a little bit, and let's do a sync and synchronize. So ideally, if this demo worked, this would go in and this is the, oh geez, okay, I named the app good app, but it's the bad app, not to cause any confusion here. Um, okay, so it's doing its thing, it's thinking. Okay, let me, let me move over. I'm gonna show you the video, which does the same thing that I just did, um, but it'll show you, so it's a little bit blurry, but the important part is coming next. So again, this is my uh, bad app. I'm doing the thing here that I was just trying to show you. And you'll see two jobs come up on the side as pods. And then I'll click into, uh, you can see me on the top right. So this is a real demo I did, which was working. All right, so I'm trying to get into the pod to see the logs. And you can see here, this is the output that comes out of TerraScan, right? So this is doing the scanning and looking at policy violations and outputting the severity. I've, I have uh, configured my demo to only fail if it finds high severity. If it finds mediums or low, it won't fail. So again, moving a little bit forward here, I uh, just want to show you this guy at the bottom here. So this is kind of hard to see, but I can see there's low 2, medium 11, high 1. Right? And because there's a high uh, severity, it's found a high severity right before syncing and pushing a bad vulnerability to production, it doesn't do that sync and it stops, right? And that's that sort of broken heart that you saw up top. So the sync didn't happen, my cluster is still secure. And then moving to the other side, let me show you what the good app looks like. So if I go back to GitHub, let's go back one, back one, good app. So you can see I've done a couple of things differently here. So I've still got my liveliness probe and readiness probe, but now I've added the security context that says, do not allow to run as root, run only as a specific user, as a specific group. And by the way, down here, I've also set some restrictions on the file system, so read-only file system, et cetera, right? So this is configuration that my policies are checking against. So in this case, let's, let's go back to the video again. So now when I um, run the same Argo CD sync operation on the good app here, so sync, sync manually, and it'll bring up the same pods again. So it's bringing up the pre-hook or pre-sync hook uh, jobs. And it usually takes a couple of minutes for the logs to come back. All right, so 
You can see on top the, there's a green heart instead of the red one, so it's, uh, it's letting things through. And if you look down here, now I've got a high of zero, medium of five. So I've still got vulnerabilities, but it's met my threshold to pass this and let this go into the production environment. Okay, so just last couple of things here. So um, again, you can go here and download this and get it working locally on your Minikube just to try it out, see how things work. You can also, uh, if I had to open a new, this one. Uh, just wanna show you real quick. Nope, not this. All right, so I've got one folder here. Um, if I look at app, so again, this is a simple deployment, right? This is something you might do. Um, Nginx also looks very similar. Right here, I've got a couple of replicas, um, what image it should come from. In this one, I don't even have the liveliness and readiness probes here. So this is a really bad app. But I can say TerraScan scan. Um, let me show you the help real quick. So you can tell it other things too. Right, so what kind of IC things you're trying to go at, what kind of, pol if you have custom policies, you can tell it where they're coming from, et cetera. You also have skip rules, because that might be important. That's where the exclusion policies come in, or workflow comes in. But for us, we're just gonna leave everything the same and just say scan. And you'll see it comes back with, it's found some IC code, and you're, you know, this is stuff we are missing. So it's missing some resource level uh, limits. Um, somewhere in here it'll also, so this is admission of root containers is what we saw in the other one. It's missing the uh, read-only permission on the file system, CPU limits are not set, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and it's got, it's got a couple of high ones as well, which is the root privilege um, policy. So let's go back to this. All right, and the last place where you should also put in your TerraScan um, uh, policy evaluation and checks is on your runtime. So you've done it at the developer, on the developer machine, you've done it in your CI pipeline, you've done it in your CD pipeline, but once, you're, once your image has made it to the, your cluster, then uh, TerraScan integrates with um, um, admission controllers. So you can, write, uh, you can write a hook there which says, hey, at this point, you know what image you're trying to grab, so go test that image and see what vulnerabilities are in there before you let this thing become a resource in your cluster. Right? That's the last place where you can check for the same plus more policies. So lastly, this, um, this is our security maturity model. You can see everything we talked about today falls in the first step of the ladder, policy as code. Right? In the, um, so automated, automated continuous assessment with your policies, custom policies, and also benchmarks that, that the policy is associated with. Because at the end of the day, then at the end of the day, you want to see which teams, which are the compliance level at a cluster level or at a teams level, whatever that may look like um, for you. Then the next step is governance as code, right? So that's where you capture your, for example, your governance decisions like exceptions. That can also be codified, right? It should be codified for uh, audit purposes, for example. Next is drift as code. So now that you've got a cluster running, you still want to see, um, you know, any time there's a change in the cluster which was not provisioned by you on the very left with your IAC files, et cetera, or your images, you want to see drift between your Kubernetes, running Kubernetes versus your resource IAC files. You want to see drift between your running containers and your images, et cetera, right? That's very important, even with all of those policies in place. Um, the next one is security as code. This is where you start looking at your breach path, your attack path, and not look at, look at one resource at a time, but look at the whole picture, as well as you want to see the impact that each resource has if it was to be exposed right, and be vulnerable. And then last thing is remediation as code. That kind of, especially in the ISC world, um, where if you do find policy uh, violations, then you want to automate that process of at least the you know, sort of the low-hanging fruits where you uh, automatically do a push a pull request and fix that uh, IAC violation, right? So I'm not sure where folks are with all of this, but this is what we consider as a, uh, you know, as you go to the right. Uh, but what I showed you today was the very left and where I think is a good place to start. 
And then I don't know how much time we have left. I think we're almost there. But this is the last slide I want to put up. There's a QR code if you want to scan that. And I can show you the site as well. But this is TerraScan in action on Tenable's uh, site. Uh, you can put in your own ISC code here. Um, again, with Dockerfile, Helm, Customize, whatever that may be. And you can see what comes up in terms of vulnerabilities. Right? And I'll actually bring that up real quick as the last thing. All right, so this one here. So it gives you uh, sample files. So since we just talked about Docker, I'll pu uh, pull that up. So this is a simple Docker file, and you can click on scan, and it'll take you, tell you the, there's, it says there's one medium uh, violation here. You can click on that to get more details as well. Right? And you can do the same thing with, um, let's say, your Kubernetes YAML files. So it supports different formats as well. Yeah, here's some of the stuff we, we saw before as well. So it's, it's good to try and just see where you're at, right? Um, and again, it's completely open source. I encourage you to jo join the community. Uh, if you see problems, raise issues, contribute if you like. And I think that is it for me. Yeah, I think that's it for me. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>